January 25th, 1774 was a bitterly cold day in Boston, with two feet of snow on the ground. John Malcolm, a 51-year-old minor customs official, was on his way home from his office near the Boston Harbor, when passers-by observed him suddenly cursing and physically threatening a small boy on a sled who had apparently rammed him. George R. T. Hughes, a poor shoemaker who had carried one of the Boston Massacre's mortally wounded victims to a doctor four years earlier, intervened to protect the child. Shouting and scuffles ensued. Malcolm struck Hughes on the head with his cane, knocking him temporarily unconscious. Bystanders then broke up the fight, and Malcolm returned home. But the crowd would not let Malcolm off lightly, and even though the scene had appeared to be a private squabble, that night, Bostonians made sure that their response were the hallmarks of revolutionary justice. Before taking on his current post, Malcolm had worked for the British Empire as a sea captain and army officer, fighting throughout the North American theater of the Seven Years' War. He had become notorious across the colonies after being arrested for debt and counterfeiting in 1763. A decade later, while working as a comptroller, he was suspended for malpractice and extortion. Many Bostonians knew of his checkered past and would likely remember that in 1771, Malcolm had helped Governor Sir William Tyron of North Carolina murderously suppress the Regulator Uprising, a revolt of backcountry farmers against colonial taxes and tax officials. At dusk, a sizable crowd gathered outside Malcolm's home at the end of Cross Street. When Sarah Malcolm failed to disperse them, her husband leaned out of a window and struck one man with his sword, piercing his chest. Malcolm then brandished loaded pistols, boasting that he would kill numerous opponents for the governor's bounty. As men started to bring ladders to take the house, the Malcolms barricaded themselves in a second-floor room, but the assailants soon breached a window. The irate intruders seized Malcolm, and as he later declared, by violence forced him out of the house, and beating him with sticks, then placed him on a sled they had prepared. Some gentlemen now became concerned that matters might get out of hand. They urged restraint and appealed to official justice. But there was no stopping the frenzied crowd. 1,200 people, according to the diary of a local merchant, a likely exaggeration, in whose eyes Malcolm had behaved in the most capricious, insulting, and daringly abusive manner. Anne Halton, a recent arrival from England, whose brother was a commissioner of customs in Boston, was nauseated to see Malcolm undergo cruel torture, first being stripped stark naked, one of the severest cold nights this winter, his arm dislocated and tearing off his clothes. Most contemporaries would have been familiar with the procedure that Malcolm was about to endure. Those who needed reminding might consult the recipe recounted by another Massachusetts loyalist. First, strip a person naked, then heat the tar until it is thin and pour it upon the naked flesh, or rub it over with a tar brush, quantum sufficit. That night, the crowd picked up a barrel of tar at a conveniently located wharf, after which sprinkle decently upon the tar whilst it is yet warm as many feathers as will stick to it. Malcolm's tormentors may have well taken pillows from his own home as he began their night's work. Then hold a lighted candle to the feathers and try to set it all on fire. If it will burn, so much the better. But as the experiment is often made in cold weather, such as prevailed that January night, it will not then succeed. Take also a halter, put it around the person's neck, and then cart him the rounds. After Malcolm had been forced into a cart, his assailants poured hot tar over his head and large parts of his body. The tar burned through his skin and scalded his flesh. Next, the crowd covered him in feathers before pulling the cart onto the townhouse, the seat of the governor, legislature, and courts depicted in the center of Revere's Boston Massacre image. They whipped him severely at multiple locations, and halfway between the governor's residence and the Old South Meeting House, they ordered him to curse Thomas Hutchinson, now the hated royal governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay, whose house, a Stamp Act mob, had virtually dismantled in 1765. Malcolm refused. He was taken to the Liberty Tree, a large elm at the corner of Exus, where again he valiantly, or recklessly, declined to condemn the governor. He was then dragged to the municipal gallows, a rope around his neck presaging what might lie in store, and still he rebuffed them. 
Could they at least put their threats in execution rather than continue their torture? Malcolm now pleaded. They bound his hands behind his back, tying him to the gallows, or swinging the rope's other end across the beam, and beat him with cords and sticks. By one account, they threatened to cut his ears off. When his torturers demanded that Malcolm curse the king and the governor, he defiantly damned all traitors. Finally, with the tar encasing his freezing, bruised body, Malcolm could take it no more. He cursed as ordered. Having already defiled and shamed him, Malcolm's persecutors added one more insult. They made him swallow huge quantities of tea, toasting the king and other members of the royal family. Malcolm gulped down the liquid until he turned pale and filled the bowl which he had just emptied. They beat him back to the custom house and all the way up to Coop's Hill, including a spectacle of horror and sportive cruelty, as Anne Halton described it, that has taken as many as five hours. George R.T. Hughes, who later distanced himself from the street's brutality, he had also been unarmed the night of the Boston Massacre, had been following the procession with a blanket to shield the hypothermic Malcolm. Around midnight, now back outside his family home, they finally rolled Malcolm out of the cart like a log. Doctors, reported Halton, considered it impossible this poor creature can live. They say his flesh comes off his back in stakes. Malcolm did survive. His physical recovery would have been slow, starting with the scraping of the tar from his body. Perhaps turpentine would have been used, as with other victims of tarring and featherings, revealing his bloody skin and likely removing bits of it with the tar to expose raw flesh wounds. It would be many weeks before he would be able to leave his bed. For the rest of his life, he would bear the scars of his ordeal. <laughs>